We are just more than an hour away from the PBS NewsHour Politico debate, which starts at 8 p.m. Eastern on PBS stations. For a preview, NewsHour political correspondent Lisa Desjardins in Los Angeles with a roundtable of guests. And Lisa, it seems like I was just talking to you <laughs> from the Capitol about the impeachment vote. Uh, and now you're out there. Could you just not, you just couldn't wait to get out of town after last night? Well, you can't accuse PBS NewsHour of being on just one coast. We hit both coasts within just 12 hours. And I think, John, as our viewers know, that's just how the news is these days. You're the same way. How many topics are you covering in a single show? We have to travel, and the stories are moving faster than we can almost. Absolutely. But you keep up with them, Lisa. That's the difference between you and me. You keep up with them, and sometimes you keep <laughs> ahead of them. We try, but I'm also very fortunate to help us through this debate tonight. We have an esteemed panel. They will be with me now, also through the entire debate. Let me introduce our wonderful anchor of NewsHour West, Stephanie Sai. Next to her, friend of NewsHour, Amy Walter, of course, of Politics Monday and the Cook Political Report. Next to her, we have Ryan Lizza of Politico, and of course, Laura Barone Lopez, also national, course, national political correspondent for Politico. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I have a question for you. With all of this news, how do any of these candidates stand out, get any attention tonight? Stephanie, what, what could happen here that could get some voters' attention? You know, I think a lot of voters are actually paying attention to these debates because a lot of them are undecided. So I think really for these candidates to stand out, it has to be about policy and it has to be about personality. I mean. Let's not kid ourselves. The first of the voting is less than two months away. There are still so many people uh, that don't know who they're voting for. So I think the candidates that really resonate are the ones that can connect on a deeper level. Um, I, you know, I think they want to get to know people. We did a poll at PBS NPR Maris last week that showed most Democratic voters care most about the candidate that can beat President huh. Trump versus the candidate that they identify with policy-wise. So I know a lot of the Democratic voters I spoke to recently, they are picturing which of these candidates looks presidential mm -hmm. and they can picture on a debate stage if there is a debate right, with, <laughs> with President Trump. President Trump. Yeah. Yeah, Amy, I saw point. you nodding about that. You, you know these elections in and out. We're 46 days, as Stephanie alluded to, from the Iowa caucuses. Right. Believe it or not, people were there. What, and it's the, where, where, where is the voter mindset, the undecided voter mindset now? Well, the undecided voter mindset, of course, is thinking about holiday shopping, <laughs> which I have not done yet. Yes. Sorry, everyone on my list. Come on. Um, I know. It's still. <laughs> so this is both. It's a good time and a difficult time for these candidates. Not just a deluge of news, but people are literally traveling everywhere and getting their focus on family and holidays. But look, this is the last time that these presidential candidates are going to have a national audience mm -hmm. before we hit the Iowa debate in the middle of um, in the middle of January, which is only a couple weeks before right. the Iowa caucuses. And the other thing, Lisa, as you very well know, a lot of the folks who are sitting on the stage may be spending some of their January, yeah. a lot of their January stuck in Washington at an impeachment trial. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that this may be the last time for a while that we'll see all of them together. And I think Stephanie makes a good point as they're all, these are the top these are the top candidates all in one place. The fact that it's a smaller field means that we could probably get more of a robust discussion than you could get with 10 or 12 candidates on stage. And let's yeah. look at this small field tonight, the smallest field we've seen on stage, seven candidates tonight. Uh, that's down from 10 in the last one. Let's look at the lineup that we've got. These candidates will be on stage in order roughly uh, by their polling with the highest polling candidates in the center. That is former Vice President Joe Biden, uh, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, and Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. They will be flanked by the other candidates who met the tougher qualifications for this debate going left to right. Andrew Yang. Then we've got uh, former uh, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Then on the other side, another senator, Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota, and another businessman, Tom Steyer, Ryan Lizza. Yeah. Yeah. What lineups are you interested in looking at? Who will engage with each other, do you think, tonight? What, what are the important yeah. points of differentiating that we could see? Yeah, you have a real dogfight in the two early states with those four candidates in the center basically being bunched up very close to each other. You could make a case for any of those four winning Iowa, winning New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. um, I remember covering the 2004 primary, <laughs> and John Kerry, who went, uh, went on to win Iowa, was at about 
3% in one poll at this point in 2003. So um, I'll be looking for how the, the two candidates on the left, um, ideologically, not on the stage left, um, Warren and Sanders, do they start to um, differentiate themselves a little bit? They've had this kind of funny non-aggression pact be between the two, two of them. Um, so we're looking for that. Does Biden, the national front runner, runner take some I incoming? Do people feel like they need to start dragging him down? Bernie Sanders, who's back in second place nationally, he has not really been the subject of, of, uh, of much criticism on these debate stages. Does he start to, to take some fire? Um, and then f finally, Pete Buttigieg, who has been the aggressor in the last couple of uh, debates, is a very gifted debater, very gifted communicator. Um, where does he, uh, he's going to, uh, if the past is any, uh, uh, is, is pr predictable, he, um, he will go after someone tonight. Will it be Biden, mm -hmm. will it be Sanders, will he, will he continue on his, uh, uh, his sort of jihad against uh, Warren? So th those are the main things looking at. Yeah. Laura, do you agree or does Pete Buttigieg have too much to lose now, now that he's obviously he's right near the top in Iowa, he's so, trying to regain momentum? I think he still needs to differentiate himself mm -hmm. or still draw those contrasts, um, potentially maybe with Biden, right, because they pull from each other uh, well, they have, they, they're trying to carry the same message forward. They're trying to both uh, carry this moderate mantle uh, all the way through. What I'm waiting for is to see if, if Buttigieg and Warren get into it, because in the last month they have started to attack each other more directly. Warren specifically, who uh, yeah. Liza mentioned the non-aggression <laughs> pact. Uh, Warren also had this uh, rule that she would not specifically attack mm -hmm. Democrats by name. She would draw a subtle contrast. She changed that this last month by directly naming Buttigieg and Biden. And so whether or not if she's uh, attacked on the debate stage, she decides to very directly draw those contrasts. I don't necessarily think she and Sanders are going to go after each other. Um, she has sworn uh, consistently that she will not uh, go after Sanders directly at all. Yeah, Amy. Well, I just want to bring up something that Stephanie Lu talked about earlier, this idea about who can beat President Trump, yeah. right? Who's the strongest candidate there? If you look at the polling we've seen come in in this last week, really, as impeachment is coming to a vote, um, what you find is that the president's job approval rating has actually ticked up a bit. Now, it's still not great. He's Cl still Clinton averaging. Clinton sort of rose a lot that, during impeachment. This one, versus. this he it, he went from averaging about 41 percent to averaging 43 percent. So this is very minor. But again, if you're, not if going you're making the case that yeah. the most important thing for those folks on the stage to prove is that they can beat a candidate who is a president in a good economy. Another poll that came out this week showed that the president's handling of the economy, job mm -hmm. approval on the economy, highest it's been since going back to the beginning mm -hmm. of the year. So I think this case to be made about, for these candidates tonight, the case to be made about, look, He's going to be tough to beat. This is a sitting president. Sitting yeah. presidents are difficult to beat. It's difficult to beat sitting presidents when people feel like that president's doing a good job on the economy. Optimism about the economy is as strong as it's been in about 10 or 15 years, maybe a little bit longer. Who's going to be the one yeah. to be able to have the discipline and the strength to, to go one on one with him? You know, another difference about tonight's debate, not only will it have the fewest number of candidates on stage, but this is the PBS NewsHour Politico debate. <laughs> and we know Judy Woodruff has said that she wants this to be about substance. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, I, I think yeah. you hear that a lot. But to me, that means issues. And, we, and I'm wondering, Stephanie, you've been talking to a lot of voters. How do you think voters feel the economy, especially Democratic voters, climate change? Where are these issues? What issues do voters care about right now? Well, I think the economy is always tops yeah. with all voters. Uh, if we're going to look at what is uh, unique to Democratic voters, climate change, especially in California, mm -hmm. factors very high on that list. But my question is, how do these candidates differentiate themselves on that issue? Several of the candidates on stage have adopted the basic Green New Deal policies. Mm -hmm. um, and so is that a place where they're going to be able to differentiate themselves? You know, one of my questions is, as we all know, e even if the Democrats are able to win the White House and 
both houses of Congress. And we're looking at probably whoever is president getting through one major piece of legislation. <laughs> Obama chose to do health care. He was not able to deliver cap and trade. So I think for a lot of California voters, um, climate change is their number one issue. But when I was going around talking to voters in the last few days, they all still talk about how expensive their health care is. Mm -hmm. And we and that is going to be a major issue, I think, that we will see delineated between these candidates is that question of the private option versus Medicare for all. I still think that is a major fissure yep. among mm -hmm. these candidates. Ryan, yeah. Liz, uh, we were talking about this Please. earlier. Talk a little bit more about Elizabeth yeah. Warren and sort of yeah. the needle she is trying to thread right now. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, health care is always at the top of uh, issue polls of Democrats. It has been for the last couple of years. And so health care, health care, health care. I know a lot of people who watch these debates have, have some, some reporters have been frustrated by, you know, huge chunks of time spent on health care. But that is the issue that Democrats say they care about. And I think if you look at the arc of these debates from the summer in, until November, you started with this sort of consensus uh, on Medicare for all. That looked like the, where it was the, the sweet spot in the Democratic primary. And slowly, the argument from the more moderate candidates has, has, has started, to, started to resonate. The polls of single payer among Democrats, not just the broader uh, public, has started um, to look a lot more favorable for the Pete Buttigieg uh, Biden version of uh, of Medicare for all, Medicare for which describe, explain that to viewers. Right. So the the, the Bernie uh, option would be everyone would go into uh, Medicare, which is right now just for uh, adults over 65, right? Yeah. Um, Warren adopted that strategy or, or that policy early in the cam campaign. Um, famously said, "I'm with Bernie." She struggled a little bit to put out uh, a plan uh, detailing how she would pay for it. She did that. But then she added a little bit of a wrinkle recently where she said in the first year, if, if she was president, she would just have a public option. In other words, anyone who wanted to buy into Medicare could do that. But in the third year as president, she would do a, a full single payer uh, plan transition to everyone in, in America would be in the Medicare program. She's now on the campaign trail, started to talk about that, started mm -hmm. to talk about the public option, started to talk about choice. Sounds a little bit more where Pete Buttigieg has been. Um, I would be surprised if that uh, difference did not come up tonight, where if, if Warren, Warren is likely to be challenged tonight on whether that's a, a, a shift or, or, or not. This is the kind of yeah. substance I'm talking about, everyone. This is awesome. You know, there is also an issue um, that is about what America looks like that I want to talk to you about, Laura Bruno mm -hmm. Lopez. The candidates on this stage will not reflect really what America looks like. There will be only one person of color on this stage, Andrew Yang. Now, the moderators, however, that's where you will actually see more people of color mm -hmm. among the moderators, the four moderators. What does that mean for Democrats? Is that a potential problem for the party, for the candidate they select? And, and what do we know about why that may be? Right. So compared to July's presidential debate, it is a striking visual difference, which was that that was the most diverse uh, presidential debate in history, five months later, today's debate, um, it, the majority of the candidates on stage are white. And so in my reporting this past week, one thing I heard a lot from Democrats, especially Democrats of color, whether it's uh, House members back in Washington or ones that are local electeds um, uh, across the country, is that there's the, they started to reflect a bit more on, on how Democrats got to this point. And there's a bit of a fear that some Democrats have, which is, what if Barack Obama wasn't just the first uh, black, candidate, or black man to be elected to the presidency, but what if he was the only person who is not white to make it through that door for years to come? Uh, and whether or not the nominating process leads to that. There's been a debate that's flared up about whether or not Iowa and New Hampshire should continue to go first anymore in the nominating process and, and how that potentially favors white candidates because of the fact mm. that those states are 90 percent white, both of them. And, and the first uh, diverse state is Nevada, um, a third that goes third. So uh, it also raises question about California's placement, right, right? which is that um, California moved their primary up to be Super Tuesday. And how much impact does that have? It, uh, 
Latinos are the biggest ethnic group in California, and that is a place where I think a candidate like Bernie Sanders is very strong, and he could potentially uh, win a state here because he's doing so well with voters like that. Yes, Stephanie. And, you know, talking to voters in California, one thing we have to remember is the absence of Senator Kamala Harris on right. this stage. Yeah. Now, Senator Ka Kamala Harris is somebody who ostensibly would have appealed to the diverse electorates we would see in a state like Nevada or California. She never had a, a, a boatload of support here in California. Um, Sanders does have the edge among Latino voters in California and elsewhere. Um, and we have to talk about the importance of these candidates that are on the stage tonight talking uh, to African-American issues. African-Americans, as we know, are so important within the Democratic electorate. None of these candidates are going to be able to make it to the nomination without that support. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're seeing that Vice President Biden mm -hmm. has a lot of uh, African-American support in the crucial state of South Carolina. But I'd like to listen to whether they are going to speak to issues that are important to those voters. And that, that's California. something that, uh, yeah, quickly, that's something that Deval Patrick, who is uh, along with Cory Booker, they're the only two black candidates still left in this race. And I spoke to him this past week, and he said the big question that he has for this debate stage is whether or not issues in, that are important to black and brown voters will be raised by the white candidate. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all. The smallest debate field in the nation's most populous state. The debate starts in about an hour. Our pre-show starts in a half hour. We are looking forward to it. It'll be a good night. Back to you, John. Lisa, terrific analysis and the sort of stuff we're going to be looking forward to you from you and your guests all night long. Uh, as you just said, remember the, uh, the pre-debate show at 7.30 Eastern, the debate itself at 8 p.m. Eastern on PBS stations.